Wow, here we are again on an amazing day to worship our Father, an amazing day to get together and love one another, and I am excited. It feels good to say that. It feels good to say I'm excited. There was a little period of time where I wasn't excited, and it was a season of crushing and a season of pressing, and there are so many awesome songs that talk about this stuff, and we sing them, and they sound amazing until it's time to get crushed, and until it's time to get pressed. Or, you know, that amazing song, Oceans, uh, going into the waters, uh, you know, that are deeper than we would like. And we love to sing those songs, and there's such an amazing connection until it's time to go into the deep water, and then it's like, whoa. So uh, I'm pretty excited to share some of this stuff. Um, I'm going to do my best. I'm going to ask you guys for some grace. Uh, I have a whole bunch of material and trying to figure out what is applicable or what um, I'm supposed to share uh, is sometimes tricky. And I believe I do have a title for this. My awesome friend is not here today, but the title is going to be Looking at the Bible with Fresh Eyes. And, um, and, and let me see here. And I, I want to try to, I don't want to try, I'm going to. I'm going to build upon what Nathan had spoke uh, just previously about uh, not protecting us, not protecting you um, from your Bibles. There's a lot of passages that we kind of just glance over um, that are a little bit uncomfortable. And when it gets a little bit uncomfortable or it's something that we're just not that interested in, we have... I shouldn't say we, I have the amazing ability to turn a few pages past that, therefore I don't have to deal with, try to comprehend or understand it. Um, I also want to throw a minor disclaimer out there. I am still researching a lot of this, and I'm so involved in research that I haven't collectively come to a full understanding in some of these things, so I want to say overall This isn't necessarily, today, isn't necessarily for me to get up and to teach you, per se, but the whole purpose of this message is to get you to think. It's to get your wheels moving. It's to get you to question the things that you read, and it is to ask the Father to reveal His truths to you, not mine. Okay? Are we all on the same page? Is everybody cool with that? All right. And if you're not cool with that, suck it up, buttercup. (laughs) <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, the Lord has been allowing me to look at his word with fresh eyes, and I wish that I could say that that's something that I'm doing in and of myself, but it isn't. It's something that he's doing in me. It's I am reading the same passages that I've read a hundred times, and he's unlocking them. He's opening them, opening them to give Uh, mean new meanings and new understandings, and it is really awesome. It is stretching, and it is scary (laughs) also at the same time. Um, So with that being said, um, I felt really led to do this after I finished putting some of this stuff together. Um, I felt like the Lord wanted me to read um, Isaiah 55, 6, and 8 first to you guys, And I guess this is my, I'm just giving you the pre-warning. This would be what we would call, at the end of the service, the altar call. But I feel like this is really the word of the Lord for this particular moment. is Isaiah 55, verses 6 through 8. And it says, Seek the Lord while you can find him. Call on him now while he is near. Let the people turn from their wicked deeds. Let them banish from their minds the very thought of doing wrong. Let them turn to the Lord that he may have mercy on them. Yes, turn to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. And so with that being said, is there anybody in the crowd right now that does not know Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach, as their Lord and Savior? Is there anybody in here that does not know Jesus as their Lord and Savior? Hmm. Let me try this a different way. 
Is there anybody in here that does know Jesus as their Lord and Savior? Let me see your hands. Uh, okay, you know, I, I may see a hand or two out there that isn't raised. It's super important to do that because you guys know the word of the Lord says that if we acknowledge him here on earth, he will acknowledge us in front of our heavenly father. And so when we do, when we fail to acknowledge Jesus as our Lord and Savior, then he will fail to acknowledge us as his children before the Bema seat of God Almighty, okay? So, again, Isaiah 55, 6 through 8, I'll read it one more time. Seek the Lord while you can find him. Call on him now while he is near. Let the people turn from their wicked deeds. Let them banish from their minds the very thought of doing wrong. Let them turn to the Lord that he may have mercy on them. Yes, turn to our God for he will abundantly pardon. I am asking you now, please, please call on the name of the Lord while he may be found. Right now, at this particular time, he still is saving souls. He still is transforming lives, and he loves you tremendously. He loves you tremendously. He died for our sins. You know, he says that not one of us are righteous, for all of our righteous deeds are as filthy rags. He says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And there's not a single person in here that doesn't need the blood of Jesus to enter in to eternal life with God the Father. I just want to say that before we get rocking and rolling. Okay. I feel confident that I shared that part. And now, it's up to y'all. <laughs> so, um, so I was going to start again with Isaiah 55, 8 and 9. But as I wrapped up my whole entire thing, I really felt like the Spirit said, I want you to go read 6 and 8 before you start with Isaiah 55, 8 and 9. So, 55... Um, Oh, and I'm sorry, it was, yeah, 6 through 8, that's right, 6 through 8, and then we're going to go 8 to 9. Isaiah 55, 8 and 9, you know, again, with what Nathan had been sharing a little bit and, and pressing into some things that maybe we thought we know that maybe we should revisit or relook at, and uh, not protecting y'all, not protecting us from our Bibles, Isaiah 55, 8 and 9, um, out of the New Living Translation says, my thoughts are completely different from yours says the Lord, and my ways are far beyond anything that you could imagine. For just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. So, you guys have heard this talked about here. It seems like it's been a running theme over the course of the last year almost, as if the Father is beginning to prepare our hearts for uh, some, some different truths or for some different revelations, some different insights, some different wisdoms. So uh, again, I want to make a couple of statements that I want you to listen to very carefully, okay? One, the Bible is infallible. Can everybody agree or disagree with that? The Bible is infallible, okay? I am not. I'm a fault. I'm a man that has fault. I am doing my best to search, to understand, to study, and while I feel like I get it right a lot of the time, sometimes I make mistakes, okay? If you feel I have made a mistake, please feel free to share that with me. And I would love to engage in conversation. And if I'm wrong, I will say I'm wrong, okay? Just want to share that. Okay, so I am merely challenging traditional models, and I'm testing them against Scripture, as it says in 1 Thessalonians 5.21, test everything that is said, hold on to what is good. It says that in the New Living Translation, test everything that is said and hold on to what is good. In the King James, it says, prove all things and hold fast to that which is good. So all we are doing, all I am doing is testing, and I am proving, and I am trying to find Scripture that backs up the things that I am studying. And that is exciting. <laughs> you know, the, the truth has nothing to hide. You know what I mean? When you challenge truth, it gladly accepts the challenge. Because truth is truth. You know, when you challenge a lie, there's offense, there's frustration, there's aggravation, there's misunderstandings. Because the lie has something to hide. Are you tracking with me? So again, the Bible is infallible. I am not. 
I am merely challenging man's teachings and testing them against Scripture. Because it says in 1 John 2, 26 through 27, I have written these things to you because you need to be aware of those who want to lead you astray. But you have received the Holy Spirit and he lives within you, so you don't need anyone to teach you what is true. For the Spirit teaches you all things, and what he teaches is true. It is not a lie. This is my added part. Or counterfeit. It is not a lie or counterfeit. So continue in what he has taught you and continue to live in Christ. It says that in the New Living Translation. Okay. Now, I want to share with you guys that I don't necessarily think that it's mankind that wants to lead us astray. In this scripture, 1 John 2, 26, you know, it says, I have written these things to you because you need to be aware of those who want to lead you astray. At this particular time, there were people that were preaching false truths leading others astray. At this particular time, I don't believe that our churches, for lack of better terms, are teaching things to lead people astray. I do believe that the enemy is twisting things and making sub-truths or partial truths elevated above the full truth. Okay, I <laughs> just want to make sure that I'm communicating clear. <laughs> um, so, <clears throat> let me see here. I don't necessarily think that it's mankind who wants to lead us astray. I do think that it's Hasatan or Satan um, that through lies and revealing false truths or counterfeits. It's, it's, it's our enemy uh, that is doing these things. And in, so I begin to look into, you know, the Lord just takes me all over the place when I'm looking at some of this stuff. It's, it's fun, it's frustrating, it's relevant, it's irrelevant. Um, <laughs> sometimes following this, it is very exciting, but sometimes following the Spirit, for me anyway, it's like, squirrel! And I just run all these weird different directions, and then trying to bring it all together so that it's relevant and that it makes sense is very tricky for me sometimes. So, in the interception or the spotting of counterfeit money, of counterfeit money, uh, they don't study the thousands of different counterfeit bills. Do you guys understand that? In, in, in looking for counterfeit money, they study the original. They study the original, and by mastering what the original is and what it looks like, they can spot a fake. You guys tracking with me? Awesome. So they, they study the original so close that they can easily identify the fake money. You tracking with me? So ooh, I feel as if we should do the same things with the Word of God. We should study the Word of God so that when we hear a false truth, we recognize that. Study the Word of God. Don't study, and, and, and don't study the, the, the 90% truth. And, and I, I can, again, uh, expose myself in these areas. You know, I have been an expert of recognizing where the enemy is at work. <laughs> I have been an expert at demons. People would even say once upon a time that I was a demon chaser. <laughs> And looking for the flaws in life and how the enemy is manipulating and lying and cheating and stealing and all these different things that I kind of forgot to brush up on the truth. Now, the Lord in his grace and mercy has me really digging into his truths. Um, and I mean really digging in. I feel overwhelmed with information. I am trying my best to get it all in me to break it down, to understand it, and then to bring it back out in a way that is palatable and understandable for people. Um, so what, I'm, what we're going to do today, overall, is we're, I'm going to read, you can read with me, I'm going to read Genesis chapter 1, the whole chapter. And I'm also going to read Genesis chapter 2, the first four verses, because I don't know about y'all in your, I don't know about in your Bibles, but in my Bible, you have Genesis chapter one, which is the creation account, 
But then it stops. I feel like maybe I'm wrong. This is one of them things that I'm learning and studying and, and trying. I don't have, I haven't come to a total truth, but I'm just presenting some of the information to you guys. It, in our chapter verse breakdowns, the creation account goes from Genesis 1 all the way to 2 4. You know, you, in my Bible, the first six days of creation are in Genesis chapter 1. And then the last day, day 7, is in Genesis chapter 2. So, I know to y'all that's no big deal, but to me, I'm like, aren't y'all scholars? I mean, is this not common sense? If we're going to run a creation account, why wouldn't we do day 1 through 7? You get what I'm saying? So, that's what I'm, what I'm talking about is beginning to question man-made teachings, okay? I mean, I started a minute ago when I said that the Bible was infallible, however, I am not. Hold on. That was the other way. The Bible, yeah, the Bible's infallible, but I am fallible. That's what I meant to say. <laughs> My wife can tell you that I am very fallible. Um, so that's just one of those small little things that I begin to question scholars. Um, in this, I'm, I, this is not, again, this is not an extensive study. This is just some of the quick things that I feel like the Father has been sharing me sharing with me through Genesis chapter 1, and then the first couple of verses of chapter 4. I wrote down six, six little anomalies that I'm going to call them. Anomalies, or they're things that raise questions in my perception or my understanding of reading the Bible, which has caused me to dig deeper. Because I'm a firm believer that when, if the Bible is infallible, and there's something that I don't understand or there's something in the Bible that contradicts itself, for lack of better terms, the problem is not with the Bible, but it's in my understanding of the Bible. Pretty simple, right? So instead of running away from something that I don't understand, the Lord has me in a season of crushing and pressing. And I'm like, yes, no. Because <laughs> in this crushing and this pressing, what we just sang, he's creating something new. And it's uncomfortable to those that have not heard some of this stuff. But it's okay. I love Jesus. He's my Lord and Savior. And I love you. Okay? All right. So Genesis chapter 1. I'm going to read out of the New Living Translation. That's, if you guys haven't noticed by now, that's probably my go-to for readings. Uh, when I'm just reading out loud, it's the easiest for me to understand, comprehend, and deliver. I do look at tons and tons and tons and tons and tons of other versions just for context. In fact, I'm going to read uh, Genesis chapter 1, and then eventually I'm going to actually read you Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 in Hebrew. I don't expect you to understand it. I'm still trying to understand it. But I'm going to read it to you because encrypted in the very first word of the entire Bible, the Father lays the plan of the whole entire thing, and he shows his son Dying for my sins in the very first word, one word of the Bible. Never knew that was there. <laughs> Never knew that was there. <sighs> okay, so here we go. In the beginning. Genesis chapter 1, the account of creation. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was empty, a formless mass cloaked in darkness. And the Spirit of God was hovering over its surface. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light, and God saw that it was good. Then he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day and the darkness night. Together, these made up one day. And God said, let there be space between the waters to separate water from water. And so it was. God made this space to separate the waters above from the waters below. And God called the space sky. This happened on the second day. And God said, Let the waters beneath the sky be gathered into one place so that dry ground may appear. And so it was. God named the dry ground land and the water seas. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let land burst forth with every sort of grass and seed-bearing plant. And let there be trees that grow seed-bearing fruit. The seeds will then produce the kinds of plants and trees from which they came, and so it was. The land was filled with seed-bearing plants and trees, and their seeds produced plants and trees of like kind. And God saw that it was good. This all happened on a third day. 
And God said, let bright lights appear in the sky to separate the day from the night. They will be signs to mark off the seasons, the days, and the years. Let their light shine down upon the earth, and so it was. For God made two great lights, the sun and the moon, to shine down upon the earth. The greater one, the sun, presides during the day, and the lesser one, the moon, presides through the night. He also made the stars. God set these lights in heaven to light the earth, to govern the day and the night, and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. This all happened on the fourth day. And God said, let the waters swarm with fish and other life. Let the skies be filled with birds of every kind. So God created great sea creatures and every sort of fish and every kind of bird. And God saw that it was good. Then God blessed them, saying, Let the fish multiply and fill the oceans. Let the birds increase and fill the earth. This all happened on the fifth day. And God said, Let the earth bring forth every kind of animal, livestock, small animals, and wildlife. And so it was. God made all sorts of wild animals, livestock, and small animals, each able to reproduce more of its own kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make people in our image to be like ourselves. They will be masters over all life, the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, and all of the livestock, wild animals and small animals. So God created people in his own image. God patterned them after himself, male and female, he created them. God blessed them and told them, multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. Be masters over the fish and the birds and all of the animals. And God said, look, I have given you the seed-bearing plants throughout the earth and all of the fruit trees for your food. I have given all the grasses and other green plants to the animals and the birds for their food. And so it was. Then God looked over all that he made and he saw that it was excellent in every way. This all happened on the sixth day. In my Bible, that's the end of chapter one. Chapter two. So in the creation of the heavens and the earth... And everything in them was completed. On the seventh day, having finished his task, God rested from all of his work. And God blessed the seventh day and declared it holy, because it was the day when he rested from his work of creation. This is the account of the creation of the heavens and the earth. Everybody got that, right? Of course they did. <laughs> so, there's a handful of of things that the Father has been revealing to me. Again, this is not an extensive study. This is just a quick handful of bat, 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 bat. And I have not had time to look into all of them. But again, the purpose of this message is to cause you to think. The purpose of this message isn't to listen to me as the teacher or of, as anything else other than your peer. For the Spirit teaches you all things. All you have to do is ask Him. You understand? Okay. Number one. The, again, these are six things that I wrote down that caused me to question a couple of things. Okay. The first thing. Um, this is this is what I'm. This is some of the stuff that I'm learning in one of the classes that I'm in. The first thing is that encoded in the first word of the Bible is a prophetic message in Hebrew. The first word of the Bible in Hebrew is called Bereshit. Okay? This, this is called the Humash. This is a Hebrew Bible. This reads from right to left, um, which is really tricky for me because I read left to right because I'm American. <laughs> and, uh, wow. All right, so I had this marked. Oh, there it is. And then I pulled my marker out. Traditional. Got. Traditional. So now I got to find, I got to go backwards. I got to go to the end of the book. <laughs> yeah, right, I know. I'm, I'm going to the beginning for sure, but, but I'm going to the end of the book because this book is backwards. All right. So this book is really cool. Um, it has the Hebrew text. It has the Aramaic text, and then it has the English text. And then not only does it have all these different texts and all of these different writings, but it also has a lot of commentary taken from the rabbis of that time, 
which is very important because they have different understandings than we have now. For instance, if Abraham, seeing that the way that some of my children in school dress, I shouldn't say my children, they would be like, what? Because it was a different time. You get what I'm saying? Um, so, and there's also, in the Hebrew writings, there's all kinds of little anomalies where letters are bigger than they're supposed to be, and those are cause for you to stop and really meditate on that particular thing. Okay, so here we go. Bear with me. This won't take long. I just really wanted to show that there... What I want to show is that Americans or Western mindsets is A plus B equals C, okay? We are really, really confident in what we believe. Well, Hebrew mindset is not like that. Hebrew mindset leaves a, leaves a sense of mystery. You know what I mean? They have a church, but they leave a bigger platform for the father to be the father. And, and that's foreign to my thought process, which is stretching me way more than I want to be stretched. But it's good. So the word Bereshit in Hebrew, the very first word, this is how it reads. Bereshit bara Elohim et ha shamayim viet ha aretz. In English, that means in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Are you tracking with me? And that one word, Bereshit, there are six letters. Six letters in this one word. <clears throat> and again, this would be a Hebrew alphabet. So the word beer sheet has these letters in it. The Tav, the Yud, the Sheen, the Aleph, the Resh, and the Beit. This is where we get our word alphabet. Aleph and the Beit. Alphabet. You see that? So... <sighs> This is, this stuff stretches me. All right, Lord help me to do this. <laughs> I've always been taught, taught, you know, that God is the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end, okay? In Hebrew, it's the aleph and the tav. He is the beginning and the end. Well, in the beginning, why does it start with the letter bait? B instead of the Aleph, if he is the beginning from the end? Good question, right? That's the exact same thing that I said. Well, if he's the beginning, why is he not there in the beginning? Why does the word of God start with the bait, the second letter? And it's because the first letter in the Hebrew alphabet is invisible, and God the Father is invisible. <clears throat> so... Encoded in the word Bereshit through these letters, the Tav, Yud, Shin, Aleph, Resh, and Bet, that's the Hebrew words, or Hebrew letters, I'm sorry, that spell Bereshit, you have the Bet, or Bar, means sun. I should have did this. This is going to be like an acrostic. What I'm going to do is give you the letters, and then they're going to mean something. I should have, I wish I had... This is the only time I've ever wished I had a laser pointer and a little thing. <laughs> Whatever that is. Um, but so you have the bait, which is bar, which means sun. Then you have the aleph, which is the first letter of the alphabet, which means one or Elohim. Then you have the sheet, or the sheet which means thorns. Then you have the rosh, which means head. Then you have the brosh, which means tree. And then you have the, the she, which means gift. I know that, I know. So, right? Bar, aleph, sheet, rosh, brosh, she. Okay? I know, I know it's difficult, but it's almost over. So what those words mean in the very first word of the Bible, or bear a sheet, the son of Elohim has thorns on his head and a tree that's a gift. In the very first word of the Bible, he's actually referenced in John 3.16. Is that not crazy? So, and we're going to move past that. These are some of the things that I'm beginning to learn that I am so excited about. Now, how do I share that with English people? 
<laughs> you know what I'm saying? Uh, uh, anywho, so that was the very first thing that I had begun to... The, the, uh, first of all, let me rephrase that. This is the first thing that the Father is showing me, not because I've done anything, but because I'm like, Lord, show me the things that I do not know. Your ways are not my ways. Your thoughts are not my thoughts. Show me your thoughts. Show me your ways. I want to, I'm your son. You are my dad. I'm going to live in your house forever. Show me what it's all about. And he goes, buckle up. So I'm buckling up, okay? We're going to close this for now because this is way above, not yet. I'm getting there. Someday I'm going to understand it, but we're working it all out. So number one was encoded in the first word of the Bible. Um, you can find it in the Shemash as, as a prophetic message in Hebrew that there was going to be, you know, uh, an atonement for our sins. You know what I mean? The Father, Son, you know, with thorns on his head would, would hang on a tree and it, and it gives a whole, new, it's like unlocked. I don't got the scripture reference, but where it says that, uh, you know, the, the Mashiach was, was slain from the foundation of the world. Before it was ever even done, he was already slain. And I'm perplexed over that, trying to really track with that. Like, hold on, wait a minute. What? But anyway, neither here nor there. Number two, God created from chaos. I'm referencing Genesis chapter 1, God created from chaos. And how I have this wrote down is you have chaos in day 1, and then on day 6, God said everything is very good. Everything was perfectly created. Perfectly. Okay, so you had chaos to perfection, then you had sin, back to chaos, which is through Christ, back to perfection. So we're making a circle. And the Father started showing me that American or Western thought goes very linear, A plus B equals C, okay? And Hebrew train of thought is very circular. You know what I'm saying? And check this out. As we get closer to the end of time, you can think about flushing a toilet. As we get closer to the end of time, Revelation came like this. But as we get closer to the end, it spins faster. And so the Father is pouring out His Spirit upon all flesh, where the young men will prophesy and the old men will dream dreams. That is happening, folks. That is happening. He makes me look a lot smarter than I am. I mean, I'm smart. I think I'm super smart, but not this smart. You know what I'm saying? So, number three, this is just a little conundrum for myself. God said, let there be light. I'm like, sweet. However, the sun and the moon weren't created until day four. So I'm like, huh, what exactly is that all about? <laughs> and, and I haven't, like I said, I, I'm, this, I'm, I'm picking my food, uh, picking at it right now. Like I want the chicken nuggets, but I don't want the peas. You know what I'm saying? So I'm going through here systematically and trying to wrestle with the things that I can comprehend. I started to go this way and I was like, too deep. Let's come back over here. <laughs> I turned the page back to something that I could really understand. That word in Hebrew actually is or, which is enlightenment. When God said, there, when God said let there be light, he released enlightenment because God is the father of lights. When he revealed himself to the Israelites, when he revealed himself to Moses, he veiled himself. When he was leading them through the wilderness, it was through a cloud by day and fire by night. He has to veil himself because he is so illuminant, if that's even a word. He is so illuminating, he is a consuming fire, the word says. His light will consume us. So he has to put a veil. Again, I'm just briefly touching on these things because, uh, you know, this guy and this guy, I know for sure, can just get wrapped up in this stuff for hours. And it's like, Lord, help me to put it together so that it makes sense. Um, so, like I said, God said, let there be light. However, the sun and the moon weren't created until day four. Just something to think about. You guys thought stimulation happening and begin to ask the Father, Lord, the things that I thought I knew, how many times have we read, let there be light, and we just assumed that he made the sun? <laughs> Not necessarily accurate. It's kind of accurate, 
but not really accurate. You understand what I'm saying? So, number four, <clears throat> um, God's days consist of evening to morning. <laughs> My day goes morning to morning. <laughs> or, you know, in, in, in worldwide uh, timekeeping, it goes midnight to midnight. But, but God's days go morning, or I'm sorry, they go evening to morning. So they, they start at the evening time, and they go all the way back around to the next evening time. That's a day unto the Lord. And I've learned from looking into a bunch of this stuff is it, it represents coming from darkness to light. That's why the Father did that. That's why he starts dark, just like when he created from chaos and he brought light in creation. It's no different. It represents humanity coming from the darkness to light. So I'm learning a lot of patterns that the Lord reveals himself in the Bible, in patterns, um, and he just keeps knocking my socks off, you know, um, for lack of better terms. <laughs> uh, so, number five, this one could get, could get me tripped up pretty good, um, was that he spoke all things into existence. However, he created man with his own hands, okay? And I'm going to give this to you, but I don't, if you want to wrestle after service, I'll wrestle. But I'm just telling you, I don't have a full understanding of this. Um, but it's good, because just like in the very beginning when we opened it up, it is, it is important for us to search things out and hold on, test everything, to test it and see where it stands up. So, uh, specifically, in chapter 1, verse 26, here, he says, Let us make man in our image. Who is us? That's a good question. Who is us? He said, Let us make man in our image. Now, Mr. Nathan and myself, I believe, are in the midst of studying a super long, ginormous, huge book by a theologian and a scholar, and he has a lot more making of sense of this. Uh, I'm not going to go into all of that with y'all, but I just want to say a couple of things that I have been taught, and I'm asking the Father to bring to a conclusion the completeness of this thought. What is that? Let us make man in our image. I've heard people ta teach that this is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. When he said, let us make man in our image, this is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, or what we would say would be Trinity. I've heard that taught. That sounded great, you know. Now I'm questioning that, <laughs> which, which offends people. I'm sorry. It's okay. I'm just questioning things. It's okay to ask questions. You know, your teacher said there's no such thing as a stupid question, right? Um, number two version of this, the second version that I've heard taught on this is let us make man in our image, is Isaiah 11 chapter 2, which specifically speaks of the seven spirits of God. God is spirit, and there are seven spirits in which he teaches and talks about. Um, and I've went there a hundred different times, and I've counted six over and over and over and over and over. And I'm like, Lord, where is the seventh spirit? And he's like, well, the first one is me. It is a spirit. But if you read it very carefully, he will show you there's seven there in Isaiah chapter 11, uh, verse 2. And the third one that is really stretching me is... Um, is taken out of Psalm 82, which Elohim is in the council of other Elohims. And it's like, wait a minute, I thought there was only one true God. And if you was to take a look at Psalm 82, you were going to see that the Elohim is in the council of the little Elohims, and he's actually judging them for doing things they were not supposed to be doing. And he's actually passing judgment on them for not doing what he asked them to do. They went above and beyond what he asked them to do, which caused issue. I can only see myself in that. How many times has the Father asked me to do something and I put a little salt and pepper on it? <laughs> he said, I didn't ask you for that. And then it got me in trouble. 
So I haven't got this uh, fully figured out to my own amazement. I don't have a definite answer on this. I wish my wife was here. She'd be recording it. I'm like, you said you don't know. <laughs> Anywho, um, so in verse 26, when the Lord says, let us make man in our image, you know, the first one I've heard taught, the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit, that's who us is. The second one I've heard taught is the seven spirits of God, which I've heard that's what he is. And now a third one I'm hearing uh, come across my ears is that when he said, let us make man in our image, it would kind of be like me saying, let's go to a football game. I didn't really ask you what you thought about it. I just threw out an idea and said, let's go. And that's kind of how this guy breaks it down with the counsel of the little Elohims. So I'm, again, I'm asking the Father for some revelation. And this message is basically just to get you guys to think. And I, I just want to say this. If I'm coming up with these six little anomalies just out of the first chapter in the Bible, I think it says there's a lot more to be understood about the other uh, I don't even know how many chapters. I was just going to say the six others, the 66 books in the Bible. I don't know how many chapters there are. This thing is chocked full of anomalies that when searched out, you, um, I'll, I'll tell you, there's a scripture for that here in just a minute. And the last one um, that I'm going to actually focus on, again, this is not an extensive study. This is just a quick read through chapter one and go, well, that don't make sense. And that doesn't make sense. And that don't make sense. And this don't make sense. And none of this makes sense. What am I doing? The last one that I'm going to focus on where I decided to pick my battle, for lack of better terms, this is how I fight my battles. That was another song today. <laughs> Anywho. Um, the one I want to focus on was that if you noticed in the creation account, day one through seven, God said every day was good except for day two. He said it is good, it is good, it is good, it is good. We got to day two, he did not say it is good. And I'm like, why, if you made everything in perfection, would you not say that day two was good? Okay. Well, God being an awesome God, he is the Aleph and the Tav. He is the Alpha and the Omega. He knows the beginning from the end. He knew that on day two, the flood was going to come, and he was going to have to wipe out that which he created. He was going to have to cleanse, is another way that I've heard it termed, because i never seen it as cleanse. i always seen it as destruction. And the Father was cleaning that had become so tainted he needed to clean it. And so day two I have wrote down here was the flood. Why, Father, did you not say that it was good? Day two was because of the flood. And so as I'm kind of, this is one of the very first things that the Father gave me, but it made it to page three. It was Proverbs 25, verse 2. Proverbs 25, verse 2, it says, It is the glory of God to conceal things, but it is the glory of kings to search them out. It's the glory of God to conceal things, and it's the glory of kings to search them out. And doesn't it say, isn't it back there in Peter that we're kings and priests? So we should search out these truths of God. Um, 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 8 and 9 say that it is indeed fact that a day is like a thousand years unto the Lord. You know, I'm just going to turn there because I, don't, I, have this, uh, I have that just paraphrased. And I would like to read the whole thing. Sorry, bear with me. Second Peter 3, um, verse 8 and 9. In the New Living Translation, it says, but you, but you must not forget, dear friends, that a day is like a thousand years to the Lord, and a thousand years is like a day. And I'm like, okay. So you created day one, day two, day three, day four, day five, day six, day seven. And I've always just assumed that was day one, day two, day three, day four, day five, day six, day seven. Not having me understand that a day unto the Lord is like a thousand years. 
So actually, when it says he did this in day one, it was over the course of a thousand years. When he said he did this in day two, it was over the course of a thousand years. This is what um, the Jewish people refer to as the 7,000 year timeline. That if God did everything in seven days, you could equate that to everything being done in 7,000 years. That's why they keep time. And actually, this year we just at Rosh Hashanah trained, changed over the year to 5782. According to the Hebrew calendar, we're in the year 5782. And if you was to run everything off of God's prophetic timeline um, as, as uh, I don't know, prophetic foreshadowing or patterns, as I was saying earlier, according to his pattern, from day six to day seven will be the messianic reign, the messianic rule and reign on earth. That's when Jesus will come down and his foot will rest on the Mount of Olives and he will rule and reign from Mount Zion, Jerusalem, for a thousand years, while Satan is bound up for a thousand years. And then from the year 7,000 on, we will enter into the new heavens and the new earth. Okay, And that even was tricky for me to understand because a thousand years, how this goes is from zero to 1,000. And the 2,000 year reign goes from 1,000 to 2,000. And the three goes from three to four. Are you guys tracking with me? So I read that. Uh, 2 Peter 3, 8, 9, and that's actually pulled from Psalms chapter 90, verse 4. And I'm going to turn back over there. I should have marked this stuff. I'm sorry, guys. But the good news is, is I kind of know where these books are. That's always plus, huh? I can get there pretty fast. So uh, 2 Peter 3, 8, 9, for, you know, a day is like a thousand years. That is actually quoted from the Old Testament. In um, Psalms chapter 90, verse 4, it says, For you, a thousand years are as yesterday, for they are like a few hours. Why is that important that it's twice in the Bible? Well, it's funny that you would ask. It's so important when things are referred to two times in the Bible, because in Deuteronomy 19.15, B, this is a two-part scripture, in Deuteronomy 19.15b, it says, Every matter must be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. Two or three witnesses. Every matter must be established by two or three witnesses. Jesus says this also in Matthew 18.16. It says that everything you say must be confirmed by two or three witnesses. And then Paul also says it, in 2 Corinthians 13, 1, he says, every matter must be established by the testimony or two or three witnesses. This is another pattern laid out in the Bible where if you recognize something happening in your life or when somebody says something to you and you hear it multiple times over and over and over and over, there's a good chance that the Lord is trying to get your attention. It is so important for things to be established in twos or threes. If they're established in twos or threes, you're going to know that they are truths, okay? So, day two was the flood, and it was not good. The Father had to destroy that which he created. The flood happened 1,656 years from the creation of Adam. And you're like, well, how'd you come up with that? Well, it's easy. It's in Genesis chapter 5. <laughs> and Genesis chapter 5... It, we get one of those things that I usually steer away from, and it's an account of the lineage. It's the lineage from Adam to Noah. It's ten generations. And so if you want to check it out, you can double-check my work. <laughs> you go to Genesis chapter 5, and it'll tell you who was where and when, how long they lived. And this is pretty cool. Um... This is pretty cool because the Father is so awesome. I was in a, I was in a class Friday night, and I had, a, I had a Jewish friend who was teaching the class. Um, and I already had this wrote down, the lineage, but she brought something to it that I'd never heard before, you know? 
I knew that through the lineage you could find the timeline. So if the timeline was um, 1,656, if that was the timeline, that means that the flood happened on the second day in between 1,000 and 2,000. And that's why God said the second day. That's why he did not say that the second day was good because he was going to have to kill everything that he gave life to. That's so wild. Um, so in this lineology, these ten generations, you had Adam, Seth, Enosh, Canaan, Mahal, Elel, Yared, Methuselah, Lamed, and Noah. Or as they say, Noah. <laughs> Noah. <laughs> and you can do this, these add all these numbers together, which get, you know, 1,656. And what's so cool was what the Lord had showed me here in the word beer sheet with what I was going to say like an acrostic type thing. This means that. He did the same thing here. I had no idea. Listen, everything is in the Bible for a reason. There are amazing hidden things in there if you will look for them. So I had a friend teaching. Um, if you're watching Miss Shanee, thank you so much. Um, it was Miss Shanee actually, and, and, and she said, Every one of those names in, in the Hebrew, a name means something. We name our kids Bob because we like Bob. They name their kids something based off of what they are, who they are. What's super cool, something else I learned from Miss Shani is if you want to take your name and you want to run your name, the letters of your name through Psalm 119, it'll tell you who you are. Yeah. So S-C-O-T-T -T is my name, Scott. Well, actually, my first name is Michael. My name's Michael Scott, but I go by Scott. And so she wrote my name, and she converted my name to the Hebrew letters, because if you go in your Bibles and look at Psalm 119, every few passages are going to have the Hebrew letter. And you can read your name in that letter, and it'll basically identify your personality. And you're like, excuse me? How did that know me? This is weird. There are so many awesome things in this book that are so relevant to so many different things. It is astonishing. Anyway, so this in this lineage, all these guys have names. And so in, in this, again, I wish I would have made something for you guys. The names on one side and the meanings on the other. In the ten generations from Adam to Enoch, you had, first was Adam, Adam, and that means man, okay? Next you have Seth, which means appointed. Then you have Enosh, which means mortal. Then you have Canaan, which means sorrow. Then you have Mahal Elel, which means the blessed El. The blessed El is, is the Lord Almighty. We get like El Shaddai, El Elyon. These are El are, are names before the Most High. Then you have Yared. Jared means shall come down. Then you have Methuselah, which means his death shall bring. Then you have Lamed, which means the despairing. And then you have Noah, which means comfort and rest. Now, when you read these, it says, Man appointed mortal sorrow, the blessed El shall come down, and his death shall bring the despairing comfort and rest. Hmm. So you have an acrostic in the lineology of the ten generations from Adam to Noah that says again, God is revealing what's happening in a, hidden, in a hidden thing, this would be, I, I sent something to Nathan, the four levels of understanding scriptures, this would be a sowed level. This would be a secret level. That I wish that I could say that I did, but I didn't. I asked the Father, and He did. He did. It wasn't about me doing. It's It's a matter of God to conceal a thing, and it's a matter of kings to search things out. I am a son of the Most High, okay? I am a king. I am a priest. Maybe I'm both. Maybe I'm one. I don't know, but they both sound good. <laughs> so, uh, again, I just want to read this to you real quick. In, in the, there's an acrostic of the ten names of the lineage from the creation of Adam all the way to Noah that said, Man appointed mortal sorrow... The blessed El shall come down. His death shall bring the despairing comfort and rest. Thank you, Father. 
Thank you, Father, for your hidden anomalies in your word. I never knew, never thought about knowing, never dreamed of knowing, never wanted to know. But I tell you, once you receive salvation, there's going to be a point in your life where you maybe will go into a little bit of a dry season and you're going to thirst and you're going to search and you're going to toil for God, the God of your salvation. And thank you again only by his word, he says, he will finish that which he has started. He will bring to completion that which he started. And when I asked him to save my soul, he started a work in me. And a lot of times he pulls back so that you press into him He'll pull back so that you press into him. And when you press in, he's going to give you a little bit. He'll give you a crumb here. He'll give you a crumb there. He'll give you a crumb here. And right when you think you're just on your deathbed and you're going to die, he'll give you another crumb. And you're like, okay, why is he giving me crumbs? And he says, because in Deuteronomy, I think it's 8.3, he says, man shall not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds out of the mouth of the Father. And so he's telling you, but how do you feed yourself? You feed yourself by reading his word. You feed yourself by reading his word. Only after you feed yourself can you feed other people. Is it, is it somebody that's well fed that feeds the hungry? Or is it the hungry that feeds the well fed? Think about it. So, uh, um, I, I was telling Rod earlier that I feel like this message is one of my most incomplete messages. That is what I have as a whole because I went from there to squirrel. You know, Father, what do you want me to see? What are you showing me? And as I'm writing all of this stuff down, I'm kind of stuck on that last little anomaly here that why didn't God say the second day was good and it was because of the flood. And then I, I stopped because I didn't know what my time was going to look like. But the Father started showing me, rolling me through tons more Scripture that I just had to put the brakes on because it's, I, need to, I need to choke this. I need to not choke. I need to swallow. I need to chew this up and digest this all myself. I'm still really green. I'm super grateful, but it's still blowing my mind. And um, so the Lord has me on this flood thing, okay, and the direction he's going me with this flood thing. It's because Jesus said in Luke 17, 26, and he also said it in Matthew 24, 38, which is uh, one of those double witnesses again. He says, as in the days of Noah, so it will be when the Son of Man appears. And so I stopped with that, but he has me now digging what was it like in the days of Noah? What was it like? What was... And I've, he's already started showing me things, but again, like I said, I kind of put the brakes on that murder was rampant, that the hardness of heart was rampant, that God himself said that he was sorry for that which he created. He wished he would have never created it. I can't imagine an illuminating God of love having that kind of remorse for that which he created. And so he had cleansed, he had to cleanse the earth and I'm learning so much more about human and, and the humans and, and uh, you know, the sons of God taking for themselves the daughters of men and how the tainted blood, you know what I'm saying, was upon the earth and the Father had to flush that because the Messiah had to come from a pure human bloodline. And as it was in the days of Noah... And some of the things that are out in the world today, they're asking us to put into our bodies that alter our DNA. It changes who we are. Just like they cannot patent something that produces on its own, on its own, corn, soybeans. They can't patent that because it came up out of the ground. But when they alter the DNA, now it's patentable. Just like it was in the days of Noah. They're beginning to taint the DNA of humanity. Call it what you will. All I'm saying is this is what the Bible says. As in the days of Noah, so it will be before the Son of Man appears. So as I was going through, um, I did have one more that I really want to share. It's so simple. Um, 
one more little anomaly, you know, and this is going to be up a couple more chapters. I just read just specifically through Genesis chapter 1 to Genesis chapter 2, verse 4. But here was another one that I've been taught my whole life, okay? I'm just going to ask you guys this question. When Noah, when the ark was filled with animals, how did they go to the ark? Everybody has this little thought in their head, oh, they come on the ark two by two. You know what I'm saying? I remember it when I was a little kid. It specifically says that in in Genesis chapter 6. Well, if you drop down to Genesis chapter 7, it doesn't say that. You drop down to Genesis chapter 7, it says all of the clean animals came onto the ark in pairs of seven. And I'm like, excuse me? You talk about wrecking my theology. And so I'm not even started digging that direction yet. I'm digging somewhere. And... (laughs) I'm going all over the place with all these different things, and I'm just, we, listen, what did I open up with? Seek the Lord while he may be found. Seek the Lord while he may be found. I'm just going to say it. <laughs> For a couple of years, we've been talking about persecution coming, persecution coming, persecution coming. I think it's coming a little sooner than we think. I think that actually it's going to happen in this year. I think that the persecution of the church is going to happen within the year 2022. I think that I was having a discussion with an amazing friend, and he was making some statements, and I was like, that makes all the sense in the world. I think everything's going to go away because we're going to roll through midterm elections, and everybody has to settle the dust so that they can get elected. But after the elections are had, it's going to hit the fan. It's going to hit the fan. And so seek the Lord while he may be found. That's why I asked if anybody in here knows Jesus or doesn't know Jesus as their Lord and Savior, because we're running out of time. We've been hurt. I've been hurt. It was taught to me my whole life. We're running out of time. And I'm like, I got all the time in the world. I'm going to party like a rock star. I'm going to do everything I want. And then all of a sudden, the Lord got a hold of me, probably from my grandma, my mom, and grandma, all my family praying for me. So there's still time, but I'm telling you, we're running out of time. And I'm telling you, seek the Lord while he may be found. And for those of you that are already have received salvation, seek the deeper things. I meant to look it up, but I I didn't. Um, My awesome buddy's daughter uh, gave a prophetic word to this house. You know, how long are we going to proceed with the elementary things? How long are we going to go over salvations and baptisms? I'm not, those are good things. But once you're saved and baptized, don't you need to feed yourself? When are we going to get off the milk and get onto the steak? Why is this important? You know, another pattern that the Lord showed me was that when he created everything, he, made, he created everything in five days, and then on the sixth day, once he got everything made, he created man. He got everything perfect, and then he made man. And it's no different with the Messiah. He's getting everything perfect right now. Those that are actually going to be in his kingdom, you know what I'm saying? He's getting them ready. That way when the king returns, he'll have a kingdom to rule and reign over. That has nothing to do with salvation. It doesn't. (laughs) Wrap your mind around that. So I'm going to stop because I already see everybody's eyes going, what is he talking about? (laughs) We're going to stop right there. And uh, I hope that the Lord has stretched you a little bit again This message was not necessarily to teach you A plus B equals C. This was to get you thinking. This was to get you to ask questions of the Father. This was to help you understand that he says that no man, we don't need any man to teach us anything for the Spirit teaches us all things, okay? This is about an intimate relationship with him. Father, teach me what you want me to know because he knows the beginning from the end and he knows that you can understand something that I cannot, You are at a different level in your walk with him that I don't comprehend and vice versa. You know what I mean? It doesn't mean that you're right and I'm wrong or I'm right and you're wrong. It just means we're at a different spot and that's okay. That's okay. But please, seek him while he yet may be found. Please, please ask him questions. Please begin to read your word with a fresh set of eyes. We can't read our words with the same revelations that we had 5, 10, 15, 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago. Were they relevant? Absolutely. But just try to look at it with fresh eyes. 
You know what I'm saying? Okay. Uh, With that being said, we're going to pray real quick. And then after we pray, I believe we're going to do a worship song or maybe two. Um, So I'm going to pray and then I'll dismiss you guys to get your kids. Heavenly Father, thank you for today. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the opportunity to come boldly into the throne room of grace. And Father, I ask that you would re, that you would you would give us more grace to understand the times and the seasons. I ask that you would make us to be that of the Bereans, that we would search out the truths of your word, that we would scour over the scriptures to understand your truths. Lord, that you would bring us into a season of objective truth. That we would let your word confirm within our hearts that on which you want us to know. Father, I ask that you would help us to lay down wrong mindsets. Father, I ask that you would help us to renew our minds to your word. Lord, I thank you. I just release protection to and through everybody as we go through this week. Lord, I just, I plead the blood of Jesus over everybody within, uh, with this is under the sound of my voice. And Father, I ask that as we go through this week, you would bring these words back to our remembrance. Help us to mull them over and reveal to us that which you want to reveal to us. Father, we ask this in your Son's amazing name, in the mighty name of Jesus, amen.